When I was five years old, my dad was shot. I remember everything so vividly like it was yesterday. I woke up, got ready for school like I usually do. Went to the kitchen for breakfast and I had a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios. And you know those sounds that go in the mind of a five-year-old where they don't really comprehend whether it's real or not, but they know they need to go to their parents just for some kind of reassurance to let them know that they're okay, that what they heard wasn't actually there. For me, that sound was a click. It wasn't just a click, it was like a In my five-year-old head, I pieced that together as the cockback of a gun. And my dad had just gone out to go pick up the newspaper like he always did. And I just figured I would go out through the front door and go meet him there. And he would reassure me and let me know that everything was okay. So as I made my way to the front door, I just see the glass shattered on the ground of the foyer. And as I looked through where the window was and I looked out, all I could see was this dark abyss in my front yard. <laughs> Everything just kind of goes blurry from then. I run into the bathroom and my mom had just come out of the shower. She was still wrapped up in her bath towel. And I bring her with me over to the front door and she hops across the glass and she turns on the outside light. And there on that front porch I see my dad standing there. The same shade of red from head to toe. I still remember the auditory screams that came out of his mouth. And something that a five-year-old shouldn't have to see. Everything from there just happened so fast. We call 911. Police show up to our door. I get escorted to a neighbor's house. My godmother comes over to that neighbor's house and picks me up. Needless to say, I did not go to school that day. I didn't go to school for the rest of that whole week. My dad was fortunate enough to have survived. And I tell this story only as a means of credibility for where I'm going. I'm talking about gun violence in the United States. So many people were not so lucky as my dad. As of 2021, over 30% of deaths in the USA were gun-related. Over two-thirds of those deaths were a result of suicide. These numbers include homicides, suicides, firearm accidents, and of course, shootings. In 2016, there were over 250,000 deaths worldwide, and making up half of those numbers were six countries, Brazil, the United States, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, and Guatemala. The United States was second on that list. They had a total of 37,200 gun deaths. Brazil was the only country that had more. They had exactly 6,000 more deaths. I know you may think that's a lot, but in in terms of grand metrics, we know that's really small. And something else to consider, the gap between second and third. Third place was Mexico. Mexico had 15,400 deaths. That is a difference of 21,800 people, greater than the initial stat itself. And that's just unacceptable. If we look on the other side of the spectrum, Japan was the country with the least number of gun deaths. They were averaging under 100 gun deaths per year in a country that has a population of over 127 million. So what's Japan got figured out that we don't? The United States claims to be so great, and yet we have this great problem with firearms. Well, let's look at what Japan has required for any citizen who wishes to buy a firearm. All citizens must attend an all-day class. 
They must pass a written exam, as well as have 95% or better accuracy in a range test. There's also a mental health evaluation and background checks, all conducted by the government. As if that wasn't enough, this entire process must be retaken every three years. And the only weapons that Japanese citizens are allowed to buy with this firearms license are shotguns and rifles. Meanwhile, it seems so easy to buy a firearm in the United States. It seems anyone can walk in with any kind of credentials and they have such a wide range of options from shotguns to pistols, firearms, semi-automatic rifles, even military rifles. It just so seems so easy for anyone to come in and get a hold of these firearms and walk out and do whatever they wish with it. What's keeping the United States from making any kind of change? Because I don't need to tell you that 37,200 people is a lot. I think it's ourselves. Second Amendment says that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed upon by the government. And this has been the main argument for anybody who, any politician who wishes to put any kind of restraint or hold on firearms. Let's keep this in mind. When our founding fathers wrote this amendment, we were under British oppression. Soldiers would walk into any home that they wanted, do whatever they wished. And they felt that people should have the right to protect themselves, to protect their families, to protect the sanctity and purity of their homes. We don't live in that time anymore. There are no outside threats to the United States. There's no reason anybody in the United States should have possession of such a weapon. Owning a gun should be considered a privilege, not a right. Think about driving. Everybody needs to take a test. Everybody needs to hop in a car and drive and prove that they can operate a vehicle safely for both themselves, their passengers, and everyone else on the road. The same should be said for firearms, something that has such power and is specifically designed to take life. How do we prevent another Uvalde, another Sandy Hook, another El Paso, another Buffalo? I think we need to re-explore the context of the words that the people who formed this country wrote. Too many times we take away the context and that has brought us to where we are today. How do we really instill change? We remember where we came from. We remember the sacrifice that was taken for this country to be able to grow and become what it is today.